Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's session. My name is Abe Mohamed Yon, and I've been a member of the CMF team for almost 16 years. Yeah, that's a long time. And it's my pleasure to be here with y'all this evening. Quick FYI, we will be recording the workshop so that everyone has an opportunity to view it later. That being said, if you have a question, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom and uh, we can have you ask live or we'll just pass on your question to Xavier. We'll also take live questions at the end of the session. So please use the raise your hand button so that we can call on you. We'll try to answer uh, as many questions as we can in the allotted time. You can also reference the supplementary materials provided for this workshop by clicking the link that Jaquetta from our team will provide in the chat, um, or you can find them at campusmoviefest.com slash workshops. One quick bookkeeping note, uh, our second CMF premiere uh, of the year is just under two weeks away on December 1st, right here at campusmoviefest.com. Come see the top 20 jury award winners from November movie making and see who takes home our coveted silver tripod awards. But without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker. Xavier Bergen is an Emmy nominated writer and director from USC's School of Cinematic Arts, as he's repping tonight. He's the director of Shudder's first original documentary, Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. He's a Sundance Lab Fellow, HBO alumni, Ryan Murphy Half Best Mentee, Top 50 Academy Nickel Screenwriting Fellowship alumni, and Screencraft feature winner. Last but not least, Xavier was a frequent CMF participant and award winner during his time at the University of Alabama. And I've had the pleasure of working with him for almost a decade. Xavier's feature documentary, Horror Noir, expounds on the history of Black Americans in horror cinema. It is the first original documentary produced by AMC Network's Shutter streaming service. The film currently holds a 100% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Horror Noir is listed as one of the best horror movies of 2019 by USA Today, Entertainment Weekly, Shondaland, Harper's Bazaar, and more. It had its world premiere at American Cinematiques, Egyptian Theater in Hollywood, along with screening at the Toronto International Film Festival. The film also won a Trailblazer Award from Fear NYC Film Festival and was a Best Documentary nominee for the, for the Detroit Film Critics Society. Uh, so with that, I will turn things over to our man, Xavier. Uh, you're muted still, my friend. <laughs> let me, let me, okay, there we go, there we go, all good. Uh, yeah, next time I'm definitely let you know to send you a much smaller uh, bio because it feels like I'm bragging. No, honestly. I like talking about you. I just like talking <laughs> about you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So yeah, um, I guess we can jump straight into it. So the big thing I wanted to dig into this with everybody was uh, the concept of writing the short film script. As the majority of you know, it's something that you're going to be using on a regular basis. You're going to be constantly making them, especially as you build your career as a filmmaker. Um, and I think it's super important to, you know, make them as much as possible, but from the fact that I've done so many of them at this point, I do think like I've been able to accrue a basic understanding of some of like the main points you should keep in mind as you're building them out. Big thing to keep in mind with this is to go and check in and all the supplemental material that uh, Jaquita just put into the chat because a lot of this stuff, not only the stuff that I've learned myself, but this is so much stuff that I've like, you know, learned over time of going on the internet, meeting folks, talking as much as possible. And a lot of the things you can find on the net, I'm just bringing them all together with my expertise and understanding and essentially saying, here's how you can understand how to use this on a regular basis in the work that you're doing. So with that, let's jump on to the next part. So here's what you need to keep in mind. Short films are a great way to test your skills as both a writer and director. Short films can be a great calling card to show off your skills. Writing and directing short films uh, can help you become a stronger filmmaker. And every filmmaker who wants to write and or direct should make a short film at some point. So just to give you a basic understanding of what is going from there, and I really want to make sure of that with writing the short film, is that this is something you need to use on a regular basis. This is something you're going to use like uh, constantly. And it's something, again, that you want to be doing on a regular basis 
consistently and uh, as much as possible to get stronger and better. But with that understanding, there are certain things, like I said before, that I highly recommend that you have in your shorts. And here's something to keep in mind. There's always going to be an ex exception. You're always going to be able to show me a short film that doesn't have the things that I'm bringing up that is still unbelievably strong. Regardless of that, I want you to understand these basics because if you intrinsically can understand them and reproduce them in your shorts, then at some point you can actually start breaking them and trying different and new things. But I want you to understand these things first. So what should be in my short film? First things first, what you need to understand is that you're going to want to have a protagonist. This is the main character of your short, of your short film. It seems simple <laughs> with me saying this, but you'd be surprised how many times a short film can have a protagonist or try to have multiple protagonists that don't necessarily uh, they don't necessarily make it as clear as possible that this individual is the protagonist. And it sounds weird to say this, but a protagonist and an antagonist and a good guy and a bad guy, a hero and a villain, these aren't the exact same thing. A protagonist is just an individual that is the main central character of your story. That doesn't necessarily make them good or bad, and they can also be a villain. A, just keep this in mind, like a protagonist can be a hero or villain, a hero or villain can be the antagonist based on what's happening in your story, okay? So you want the protagonist. So what is it that you want your protagonist to have first and foremost? And that's going to be a goal. The protagonist of your short film should be trying to achieve a concrete, real objective. The goal the protagonist is trying to achieve should not be vague or an idea. The goal should be a real person and or thing and or destination. So when I say that, I mean that your protagonist is here. They want a cup of water. They are very thirsty and they are going to try and get the cup of water at the other side of the room. It doesn't need to be this nebulous idea. It doesn't need to be five or six or seven different things. It needs to be one concrete, actual situation, event, person or thing that they can actually reach in touch with their hands. That's the place that you just start off with first and foremost. Don't be vague about the goal, make sure the goal is tangible and it can be reached, okay? Next, you're gonna want an antagonist. So an antagonist is a person, event, or situation that is actively trying to stop your protagonist from achieving their goal, okay? Here's what I want you to keep in mind. If you have a protagonist and you have their goal, whatever that is, the antagonist is just the individual who is trying to stop is the individual or the person who is trying to stop them from achieving their goal the antagonist can want the same goal which is sometimes very very good to do they can want something different but whatever the antagonist is doing and the motivation it needs to be in opposition to the protagonist getting the goal that they're looking for finally you need and i highly recommend this a clear ending where they achieve their goal or do not achieve it don't be vague or non-committal about this. Your protagonist should succeed or fail at achieving their goal. Now, here's the thing to keep in mind. A goal and an ending can sometimes be a little bit different. The goal of saying, like, again, the water and trying to get to that. You can have an ending that's ambiguous, that's good, or that's bad. That doesn't matter. What matters is the goal that you set up for the character. By the end of this story, do we see them achieve that goal? or not. And it's okay to have them succeed or fail, but you want to have that so the audience has a feeling of satisfaction with the journey that you sent them on. Okay. So with that understanding, I just want to put out a simple story to keep in mind. So Jane must, must submit her assignment in five minutes or she'll get a zero in class. Peter, her little brother, wants Jane to play with him, but Jane is busy writing her assignment. Peter steals her laptop so she can't do her work. Peter locks himself in his room and says Jane can get her laptop back if she promises to play with him. Jane, with one minute left, logs into her class through her phone and finishes writing her assignment. She submits it. When she's done, she tells Peter they can go play now. Okay, so with this story, what can you pull from it? You know that your protagonist is Jane. You know that goal, the goal that she has is Jane needs to finish her assignment in five minutes or she'll receive a zero. The antagonist is Peter. 
because he steals Jane's laptop so she'll be forced to play with him. And then you have a clear ending. Jane succeeds in finishing her assignment and does not receive a zero. Now, here's something to keep in mind with this. Now, I, especially when you're starting off and just trying to understand storytelling, I really highly recommend always trying to push it to where your ending is clear and the protagonist either receives what they're trying to get, their goal, or they don't. As you get bigger, you can make that more nebulous, but on the smaller level, especially in shorts, you, want, you don't want your audience to be confused. You want them to be following everything that you're doing on a regular basis. Now, like I said before, there can always be places where you'll show me something that is completely the exception of what I'm saying, but this is the overall basics of what I'm getting at when I say figuring out a simple story and what a simple story needs to be as compelling as possible. Now, before I jump onto anything else, are there any questions or anything like that about like what should be in the story, what I mean by protagonist, antagonist, having a clear goal, anything like that, any questions before we move forward? No questions as of now. Okay, cool. So let's jump on to the next one. So how to make a strong short film. So again, a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna be bringing up, you can all find it in the supplemental material as well. You will all find it there. Okay, so here's what you gotta keep in mind. Focus on one core idea. Stay away from complicated ideas. Think of one simple core premise you want to explore and stick to that. Too often you'll see people who are trying to take their entire feature, their entire pilot, and just crunch it all into you know five minutes. That usually really doesn't work. And while it may have a core idea to it, you're just essentially at that point trying to cram this full story and it's gonna feel truncated and not feel like it's a full journey that's being earned. So in this instance, focus on a small, simple core premise that can be got across by anyone watching it, okay? Next, know your protagonist. Understand who your main character is, what they want, and why they want their goal. You should not go any farther in your story until you're able to figure out what is it that your protagonist is going on a journey for? Where are they starting at as an individual? Where are they ending at? And what is the goal or that, that uh, unattainable thing that they're trying to go towards and succeed at, fail, and succeed at grabbing or never getting? So keep that in mind, know this character well. Now, next thing is you need to know your antagonist. It doesn't matter if your antagonist is an event, an extraterrestrial person, a creature, uh, a thing, it doesn't matter. You should also understand what your antagonist wants and why what they want means they must stop the protagonist from reaching their goal as well. Again, always keep this in mind know your antagonist well enough because you don't want to say the antagonist. So if the antagonist says, or someone asks like, why do you want that thing? The antagonist shouldn't say, I want that because I'm evil or I want that just because. There has to be a tangible reason why they also want their goal. And more often than not, if you set up for their goal and the protagonist's goal to be similar or be the same thing, then that intrinsically builds the conflict that's going to have to happen in your story. Finally, you wanna focus on a central question. How would you state your one core idea into a question? So for example, my core idea is about a dying man who would do anything to live. My central question is, would you be willing to kill your child to gain mortality? Essentially, when you think about the core idea that you, we talked about at the top, can you take that core idea and put it into a one sentence question that essentially summarizes the premise that you're trying to get across. If you're able to do that, then there's a good chance that your premise is simple yet understandable enough for you to move forward, okay? So jumping from that into short film fundamentals. So here's the other thing you wanna think about too. You want to define your genre. Knowing what type of film you're making, action, comedies, horror, sci-fi will help you understand how to write your short film. And I say this to keep in mind that you want to define it first and foremost, how an act, okay, you could be writing the same story about a boy who's trying to find his dog, for example, but how an action film, how a comedy film, how a sci-fi, or how a horror, each of these different genres can completely deal with that idea in completely different ways. Now, of course, you can take a genre and say, I want to do an action horror or a comedy horror 
or a sci-fi action adventure. That's very much, you know, there. But what you should keep in mind is usually your genre is going to be whatever you first say it is. So action, comedy, horror, sci-fi. And you want to make sure you understand exactly what that genre is first and foremost that you are working within so you know the constraints of it and what you need to actually put together. OK, so be sure as you are putting everything together, know the actual specific genre that you're trying to actually build this story out. Next, jumping into is what is your theme? Figure out the main idea underlying meaning you are trying to convey. It's really that simple. If you understand your core question or your core premise, then you should be able to come back around and ask what are the themes beneath that core premise that you want to be able to help your audience understand or convey, okay? Next, after you have those things, you can start thinking about outlining your story. So here's something I highly recommend. Never, ever, ever go to script before outlining what's gonna happen in your story. You wanna be able to sit down and go scene by scene by scene, usually in a Google Doc, whatever you use, and break down what's gonna happen in each scene and what your characters are doing in each scene. This will help you have a fundamental understanding of your overall structure, but also when you want to take your short film. But you should learn this type of stuff because it's going to help you as you move ahead and you begin to write more than just shorts because you want to make sure you know what you're writing and you know where you're going first. And the worst thing that can happen to you is if you start writing without thinking about it, you get stuck in a place, you get lost in a place, you're not sure how to get out of a problem. And essentially you have to go back and rework everything instead of having this outline that you can look at to understand where your story was going in the first place. So I highly recommend this. Try to stay away from just sitting down and just writing, you know, just off the top of your head. Sit down first after you've figured out the story, the idea, the theme, what you're trying to convey, and do an outline first and foremost. It will save you so much time. Finally, keep it simple. Be practical with your story. Write what you know you can do. If you don't know special effects, you don't know how to make a saucer, you know, fly up. You don't know how to, you know, actually put in weapons and fake showing the man able to shoot. If you don't know those things yet, or, you know, I give an example here where it's about, you know, which is turning people into frogs. If you don't actually know the systems or you don't have someone who understands how to do certain effects, certain ideas, then you need to stay away from them. Keep it simple at that point because of the fact that if you try and do those things and you don't know them yet or you don't put in enough time to learn about them, they could come out looking cringy or bad in your story. And again, you don't want to be basically grab into too much that you don't know how to actually make yourself yet. Or if you're going to do something that you don't know, make sure you actually hire on the people who know how to do it. But I highly recommend as you're just doing your first short films to just keep it to something simple to where you're not gonna need a bunch of outside help to put it together, okay? So jumping off of that, the next thing you wanna think about is questions to ask about your story. And this is some of the things that we've gone over before. So what is the core idea? What is my story about? That's your premise. Who is it about? That is your protagonist. What is the genre and style of my screenplay? And keep in mind, Genre and style do come together because every person has a different way of writing, but there are some major ideas and understandings within each genre that is very niche unto itself. So understanding your genre also helps you to understand the style of how you may write it. But also keep in mind, style is very much an uh, individual, unique thing. And that's going to speak to how you will write. And the only way you're going to learn that is just to continue to write on a regular basis. So next jumping into that is who or what is giving the protagonist grief. That is your antagonist. Again, the antagonist can be a person, a thing, a creature, a event. It just needs to be in direct opposition of what your protagonist, who is your main character, wants in the story. What is the question of my story? Essentially, it goes back to the core premise. If you know your core premise, then you can figure out the question that you are asking the audience and you want to keep it simple. If your question needs two or three or four um, sentences to get it across, then it probably isn't simple enough, especially for a short film. Next, jumping into whose POV is a story told from. POV means point of view. 
I highly recommend as you're starting off to just allow your POV to be your main character. Whatever's happening, stick with them and stick from how they're seeing it. Now, of course, you can find places to change this, but because of the fact that a short film tends to be anywhere from two minutes to 12 to 20, but usually somewhere around like an eight to 12 minute, that's usually what a short film is. You don't have a lot of time to develop a whole bunch of characters. You barely have enough time to develop your one character, your main central character. So you really, really wanna try your best when you're first starting off for the POV to always stick with them until you get stronger in your understanding of how to characterize someone as quickly as possible. Because if you at least stay with them in their POV as much as possible, then people will at least come to understand your character no matter what, all right? Next, what happens in my story? Simple, that's your plot. But there's so much more to it and we'll jump into that in a moment. Next, how does it happen? That is your structure. And that is why I highly recommend doing an outline so you can see from scene to scene to scene to scene how your structure is playing out because you might need that to go back in and change things around, rejigger your story, figure out how you can make it expand on it or how you can make it smaller and shorter. What is my screenplay about thematic? Again, that speaks back to your core premise. If you understand the core premise, you understand the question that you're asking, then you will know the theme or the thematic understanding that you want to get across in your story. And then finally, how do I convey my plot, action, and theme and images? This seems pretty simple, but I mean, one of the things that younger new filmmakers really jump into that they don't understand is that a film is supposed to be scenic, supposed to be visually arresting. You should not focus, and we're gonna get into this in a second, you should not focus too much on other things, on other understandings. So sound, yes, but first and foremost, your work should be understood through the visuals that you are creating and putting in front of us. You should not be using dialogue and other understandings to try and push that if it's not your visuals first. And we'll get into that more so you can understand that better, okay? So before I jump on, are there any questions, any thoughts on these pieces? Because the next piece we're gonna get into is talking about characters and what you need to think about when it comes to them. Nothing on that so far. Okay, cool. So let's jump on the characters. So here's what you wanna keep in mind as you dig into characters. And this is the thing that's super huge. It should be characters first, plot second. Who your characters are and the decisions they make should move the plot forward. Your plot should never dictate how your character makes a decision or choice. So keep this in mind. This is so, 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 so important. Your main character, and but especially like all your characters, but especially your main character should be the main reason why everything is happening in your story outside of possibly maybe the inciting incident. You have such a small amount of time in a short film, you have to get to it as quick as possible. And what you don't need in a short film that'll automatically make it weak is to have a passive main character who on a regular basis allows others to make the decisions that they should be making to push the story forward. And on a bigger level, if you have a plot in mind and you know how your plot wants to go, then you need to build a character that speaks to that plot. But what you should not do is say that, let's say your character is a happy, quirky, go-lucky individual. And then the way that they get to the next scene is that they have to jump off a roof or they have to, you know, I don't know, let's say be sad. If that, them being sad and jumping off a roof is literally not in the character, then you have to figure out a way how that can be forced upon them. But what you can't do is just have your happy-go-lucky character who never talks about dying or who never talks about jumping off cliffs decide to just go jump off it because your plot needs that to move forward. That is allowing your plot to dictate character instead of characters dictating your plot. Always keep that in mind. Your characters are first and foremost your most important understanding. They should always be the reason everything is pushing forward, especially your main character. So write their backstory. This is something that a lot of folks really don't take in mind or really appreciate just how long it can be. You need to know your characters, especially your main and supporting characters, whether that's a feature or whether that's a short film. So what you shouldn't do is go into a story and you don't know 
anything about them and how they would react or how they would talk or how they would deal with the situation. Like, it sounds silly, but like, literally, you ask yourself, if someone were to throw water in your character's face, how would they react? And you want to have a specific niche understanding of how that individual would react because they shouldn't react how anyone else reacts. It should be unto themselves. And the only way you're gonna understand that is if you sit down, write their backstory and know who they are. And the quickest, easiest way to deal with this, especially if you're new, is for you to focus on people that you already intrinsically know. So whether that's your mom, your dad, a best friend, your brother, your sister, if you intrinsically know them so well that you know exactly how they'll act in a situation, maybe that should be the person that you base this individual on and then build out from there. So that's something to keep in mind. But always write the backstory, know who this individual is because their backstory is going to dictate how they would act in any scenario. Okay, jumping on from that, base your characters on people you know, just brought that up. It's always easier to write a character if you already know how they're gonna act. So if that means basing your characters on yourself, your mom, your dad, your sister, anyone around you helps you to intrinsically know them better and how they react, do that, especially right now as you're learning, okay? So don't, next thing, don't make your characters perfect. So it's the whole idea of like the, the Mary Sue. It's the character, who is perfect, never does anything wrong, everybody loves them, everybody wants to be around them. That's super, super boring. There's nothing interesting about that character because you haven't given them an actual flaw. Your character should not be perfect. Now, does this mean that they need to be a terrible, horrible person to be interesting? No, that's not true. But everyone, literally everyone has flaws figure out what, what is a flaw about your character. Figure out what is something bad about them or maybe they don't like or that they're embarrassed about. Figure out those things because those are the type of stuff that you're gonna wanna put into the story and make them deal with. And that makes them relatable to the regular individual. If you make your character too perfect, no one is going to like them because they're not going to feel like they can enjoy or understand the story because they're already a perfect quote unquote individual. Okay. Finally, characters must have, for this slide, here, characters must have hard choices. They have to make hard choices. Give your characters hard choices that have consequences for them. Hard choices to find a character and let us know who they truly are. This is very, very simple. If your character loves something, then, and they have a goal to get that thing that they love, then put a decision that makes them choose between some, this thing that they love and something else they value just as much. Make them choose between it. Give them actual choices that will have consequences that will benefit, hurt, maim, kill, uplift them. You need to give them choices that put them at a dilemma and make them have to choose between things they love, things they hate, things they believe in, things they don't. You need that because that will always, by giving your character a hard choice to make, almost always will help your audience understand who your character really is. So again, think about it. If you have an individual, he's hiding behind you know, a store and he's seen someone get mugged across the street. That individual in that moment can run out there, tell the mother to stop, maybe he beats them, maybe he gets beat up, or he keeps quiet, hides until they get done mugging the person. Maybe that person dies, you don't, that's all based on your story. But quite literally, that character making the choice to go fight the muggers or hide and let them do what they want, speaks volumes about who they are and tells us the, tells us the audience who they are. Give them hard decisions to do. It'll only make your character stronger. And the more that you can give, the better we will understand them. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next part when it comes to characters. So make your characters struggle. Don't make it easy for your characters to achieve a goal. The more your character has to struggle to achieve their goal, the stronger your short film will be. If they struggle and achieve their goal, the audience will cheer them. If they struggle but fail to achieve their goal, the audience will empathize with them. This is a big part because, you know, it's something that I feel like a lot of you will run into, especially when you jump into features. But even in short films, this is true. People say you have a great beginning. 
then you have a great ending, but your middle's having problems. Super, super vague uh, breakdown. And I'm sure a lot of you have maybe even ran into that before. And you ask, well, what does that mean to have a strong middle? What that person is not articulating to you is that they're not saying that your middle is bad. Um, what they're saying is that your middle, whatever that is, is a huge chunk of your story and it doesn't have anything pushing it forward. And more often than not, that is because you are not giving your character hard choices to make and you are not making your character struggle. So here's the thing to keep in mind. Struggle does not mean that your character needs to get named, beaten, killed, hit, lynched, all that type of stuff. It doesn't mean that you have to put them through the ringer on a physical level. What it means is that if you have a goal for that character, you need to set up multiple obstacles that stop them and that character on their own, and that's the strongest way, can figure out how to get above these obstacles to keep going to their goal or pivot and find another way to get to their goal by allowing them to have hard choices that make them struggle to get to the goal, we as the audience is going to root for them more to be able to get it. That's how you make us invested. If you have a character, he wants a banana, he goes and grabs a banana, eats it, and that's it. That, even though you had a protagonist, they have a clear goal, they got it, they succeed at getting it, but because you didn't put any obstacles to stop them from getting that, it doesn't feel satisfying. And you as the audience aren't going to enjoy this film because you didn't feel like the individual, the protagonist earned what they were trying to get, okay? I hope that makes sense. So make your character's motivations clear. If we understand why your character wants something, we will understand why they're making the choice, a clear goal, i.e. Jane wants to submit her assignment or she gets a zero will help to find strong motivations. It's really, really simple. If the character has, if you have your protagonist and they have a goal, that means they have to be motivated. There has to be a reason why they want their goal. You have to make sure that is clear. Do not make your motivations ambiguous or unclear. That's a death meal in a short film because you want your audience to know where your character is going and why they want something. So you take the character, they want to go grab a banana. They want that because they haven't eaten for three days. The banana's all the way on the other side of the town and there's a whole bunch of gunslingers trying to kill him to where you know he can't get to his food. He has to figure out a way to defeat all those gunslingers to get to the food while he's starving. That is a struggle. That is him having to figure out ways to get to his obstacle. And if he's able to get to it, you are going to end up loving that character because they did what you thought was impossible and or very, very hard. Don't make it easy for your characters. All right. And that's, and again, not making it easy and doing all of that if you want people to also understand and cheer for it, you need to make sure why the character is doing it is obvious to the audience. So again, with the one I just brought up, it's obvious because he is starving, he hasn't eaten in forever. So that is a very clear goal and a reason why he wants to be able to get that food. All right, so jumping on, put a character on a timer. So this one is a little bit more, it's not super complicated, but it's the same thing that Alfred Hitchcock did when he talked about putting the bomb under the table. Essentially, a character becomes more compelling if their goal has a time limit. So in your short film, if they have a goal, you don't want it to be like, oh, there's your goal. You can get it in two weeks. You can wait a month to get your goal. In a short film, because of a small amount of time, more often than not, you want your goal to be something that they have to grab now. So it's like, again, using what I said before, the man, he wants the food at the end, there's a bunch of gunslingers topping him, and you would add he has 15 seconds to be able to get over there and grab it or someone will throw away the food, okay? What that does is it puts your character on time limit to get what they want, which if he has struggles and or hard choices to make, only makes it harder for him because he has to think of them even quicker and that can lead to dire consequences for good or for bad. You are adding things to this mountain 
of them reaching the goal. And by adding these things and putting a timer on it, you are not only making it harder for them and they have to figure out things quicker, but you're also making your audience lean in and ask, will they make it to their goal or not? All right? So jumping on, give your characters a strong perspective. This is huge. An interesting character usually has a strong perspective about a subject. They're not in the middle about a topic. Example, if your story is about saving or killing a spider, your main character shouldn't kind of like spiders, but also kind of dislike them. Your character should either love spiders or absolutely hate them. Why is that? It's because most characters and the way that we set up everything and the way that humans overall understand you know, journeys is usually in most journeys, we want a character to go from seeing it one way and by the end of the journey, they have a new epiphany or understanding that makes them go in an opposite direction. Now, that doesn't necessarily always mean that the opposite direction is completely hating the thing that they wanted to get or go like that, but there has to be somewhere where they start and by the end, they either learned or understood something. And here's the thing to keep in mind. This does not mean that your character has to learn something for the better. They can actually become worse. You can have a murderer as your main character and they turn into a serial murderer. That's still a change. Or you have a murderer that goes on and repents for what he's done. That's still a change. You still saw a change in them. It doesn't matter which way it goes, so long as they have a change. But the best and strongest way to have a change is if they are extreme. Well, not always extreme, but if they are on one side or one position of something, and there's a completely different side to understand. You don't really want your characters to be someone who's in the middle, who's centrist about an idea because that doesn't give them room in most cases to learn something that sends them to the other side or takes them on the journey. Now, of course, can you find things probably that, uh, you know, just prove me on this? Sure. But on a basic level, being able to show a character, have a strong perspective and see a change over a short film is one of the most basic things you need to know as a storyteller. If you can't do it in a short, then you might not be able to do this in a feature. So understanding how to build this out and giving them a strong perspective is really, really helpful for you as a writer, okay? So we're gonna keep on going. Here's the other thing, and this is something I just brought up before. A character should change. Now, this is not an absolute, but it can be helpful to make a compelling character. If you're character is about killing or saving a spider. Your character should start the beginning of the film hating spiders and by the end of the film learn to appreciate spiders. A character growing for better or worse in their beliefs is always a strong relatable choice. So it's what I brought up before to you that if you have a story about saving spiders don't make it someone who kind of likes them kind of you know doesn't like them. Either make them they hate spiders they're the worst thing in the world they're demons or they love spiders they'll put one in their mouth they'll kiss it it's all good and let them see a change for better or worse of that individual. That's how you end up making first a character who's just interesting in the first place. Because again, you don't have a lot of time with these shorts. So you don't have a lot of time to develop this character. So anything that you can do to help us understand who they are and how they view things as quick as possible is good outside of just straight exposition where you just say it, okay? So remember, character a usually a strong one on a regular basis should change. You can show me differences in it. So I think like an example of uh, Mad Max Fury Road where the main character Max, uh, he doesn't change. But in the story, Furiosa, the person beside him who's basically the dual protagonist is the one that has the big change and that ends up working out just fine. But even in that story with the main character not having change, there was a character who was just as important who had the change instead. Okay, but you usually can't get away with that in a short. You want your short to be to the point, so you usually need it to be just one character you're focusing on. Okay, next, make your protagonist actionable. This is a big thing where I talked about, you know, character first, plot second. Your main character should always be the reason the plot moves forward. Your main character should never be passive. Other characters should not be the ones making decisions for them. A main character whose action almost always dictates what happens in your story is usually a strong character. This is as simple as I can make it. If you have a decision in your story and you need someone to figure it out, it should almost always 
be your main character. It shouldn't be other people taking those choices, hard choices, struggles away from them. You need it to be your main character. That's how you make a character that's, that's compelling, that's interesting, and that you want to watch. Okay? So, with that understanding, that's everything on characters. Any questions and stuff before we jump into plot? Not for now. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, jumping into the plot. So, this is the thing I said before plot second, characters first. The plot of your story should be driven by your main character's actions. A plot becomes weak when you make characters do actions for the sake of plot instead of because of who they are. I mean this, and this is such a huge thing to keep in mind. Your plot should never be the reason why your character does something. It should be that your character, who has the motivations and has a goal, makes a choice that either gets them further to the goal or away from it based on what they make a choice on. And because of that, we go on to the next plot point or to the next scene. What it should never be is that you need your character. Let's say, for example, your character, and you know, it's the uh, same thing. Uh, dude, hungry, bandits, and bandits, and then he has the food. What you should not do, for example, is just have your character be able to just walk through all of the bandits and shooting at him, it doesn't hurt him at all, and he just grabs it. That feels like it's a plot convenience unless you set up this story and he's like Satama, uh, Satama, I'm not saying the, uh, the, the name right, but it's, I think it's Satama from One Punch Man. Unless you've already built a character that's always supposed to be OP and overpowered and that's a part of the story, then doing that in this moment instead of figuring out how your character can be smart to get the food, that's going to hurt your overall story because you're thinking about it plot second. I mean, you're thinking about the plot first and how your character moves the plot forward instead of it being, well, I'm sorry, you're thinking about how, based on what you want in your plot, you make your character do those things instead of your character, by virtue of who they are, making choices that move the plot forward. There's a huge difference between the two. And if there's nothing else that you take from this, take that. Okay, jumping up next, map out your plot. Again, this goes back to what I mean about doing outlines. Before you go to script, write, write your plot out via an outline. Write each scene and how it will happen, Doing this instead of just immediately writing will help you understand your plot. This still goes back to structure and what I brought up before. Before you get to a script, before you start writing, sit down in a Google Doc somewhere and go plot point by plot point by plot point. What is going to happen in your story? Because you may write it out, but it may, may make sense to you. When someone else reads it, maybe it doesn't. And you want to be able to go back into your outline and rejigger things to where it does make sense, where it speaks to your character's motivations before you have to go into the script. Because if someone catches that problem while you're already in script form, that's so much more work than if you had caught it at the outline level. Next, finally, the three act structure. This is super, super simple. Um, this is something you probably harped on or learned about so many times before. And what I really want to get across to you is that, you know, it's simple, but there are some main things that you want to keep in mind when it comes to your three-act structure, especially in a short film, all right? So you have your beginning. In your beginning, you want to intro your character and who they are. You want to set up their want and goal, and you want to set up their protagonist. So literally, let's just say that this is, we're going to say that your script is three pages at most. So that means that there's about, you know, three pages per each of these. But even then, it's not exactly that. So in that first page, for example, if we're going to treat that as your beginning, then in that first, you know, scene or however much time it takes on that first page, you want to know the character, find out who they are. You want to know exactly what their goal is they want at the end. And then you want to be able to intro and know the antagonist or individual that's trying to stop them. Now, you get to your middle. They are going to struggle to get to this goal. And usually you want them to fail or succeed at a mid goal at the midpoint. And here's something to keep in mind, especially when it comes to the three act structure and when it comes to mid goal. So when you hit your midpoint, usually if your character wins at your midpoint, they're usually going to want to fail at the very ending of your story. Or if you flip it, if the character fails at the midpoint, usually you want them to win at the end of your story. Now, you can go either way, and it can also be different, but that's usually how things are set up in this type of way. But no matter what, with your middle, you want to see them struggle. 
you want to see them trying to get the goal, they're not able to get it, and they have to go through obstacles of getting to it. Then finally, you're in. They reach their goal, and either they'll fail or they'll succeed at attaining this goal. Now, this seems very, very simple, but if you're able to set these all up and you're short, then more than likely, it means that you have made sure everything that you're writing is clear to the point and it's not going to be convoluted or it's not going to be, what's the best way to put it, confusing to anyone who reads your script or who watches your short. And yeah, and I think this is something really big that, of course, if anybody after this is done wants to reach out and talk to me more about it, more than happy to. But this is something that while I do want you to keep it in mind, if you're doing a lot of the work that I'm telling you before, a lot of this stuff will end up falling into place or be a lot easier to put together. Okay, so let's jump on. So here's a huge, huge one. I think everybody needs to keep in mind. You need to stay away, stay away from exposition. So to understand specifically, exposition tends to be information that you need to convey to the audience to understand your story, but you're not doing it via a visual way, okay? Basically, if I'm going to bring it down, it's just like when you have your characters just talking too much, they're doing nothing but talking, and they're basically saying everything that everybody needs to know. And you actually, I'll wait on that you will understand more of why I'm bringing this up. So to read, stay away from your characters, constantly saying information the audience should learn via actions. Example, wow, Tommy died on his mom, died and his mom now lives in a haunted house with the ghost that killed him. Also, Tommy's dad is an alcoholic who lives up the street and is dying. So this is exposition. You're telling the audience exactly what they need to know, but in a manner that feels unrealistic and unnatural, because that's not how we as people usually interact and talk with folks, okay? So in the above statement, you could have a scene where Tommy dies. You can write a scene with the mom, uh, with the mom sees a ghost in the house. You can write a scene where the ghost kills Tommy. You can also write a scene where we see Tommy's dad drinking alcohol, drinking while alcohol, uh, I'm sorry, we can see where Tommy's dad is drinking alcohol and he looks pale and under the weather. If at any point it feels like your character is talking to the audience, trying to give them information they need to know, instead of to the people in the story, you may be relying on exposition to tell your story. So there between the example and then what I said with the above statement, where I brought up different ways that you can show visually what, tip, what uh, Tommy is saying up here. What you don't want to have happen is have your characters reveal and talk about your situation and what they're going through over and over again. That ends up being exposition, okay? And you do not want to have a bunch of exposition in your short. And I'll say this, not be very uh, honest about it. If your short, let's say it's like six or seven pages and I read it and I notice that about four to five pages is just dialogue, then I automatically know that you're focusing and you're using too much exposition because you're not allowing what your characters need to be doing to tell the audience what the story is about. You're just having them say it. And that ends up being way, way too easy and unsatisfying for most audiences. So there are some moments where exposition is needed to clarify the story. Like I'm not gonna say that exposition is something you should always stay away from, but there are methods in doing exposition right. So getting out exposition during an argument or intense moments of extreme emotional masking. So your characters are happy, super sad, super angry. Those are places where you can have them shout or bring up exposition and folks won't feel it's exposition because it has an emotion tied behind it, okay? Next, making exhibition fun, such as wrapping up in a fairy tale or an animation can mask obvious information. This is something, if any of you guys have watched any Disney movies and you see the beginning where they're like, you know, in the castle, they're talking for a second, or you have the Star Wars slug, the famous one that's coming towards you, that makes it interesting. And it's like, ooh, what is this more about? So you want to read it, you want to know because you're interested in it, but it's also masking the fact that it is exposition by making it fun. Next, you could put a funny or dramatic moment in the background of the character's expositional discussion. So let's just say two people are having to talk about them 
uh, you know, putting old yellow down, putting the dog down. Well, in the background, maybe you see that dog still spry, feels great chasing after folks, and you have something hilarious and funny in the background that we can watch while we're getting relayed this expositional information and we might not realize it as much. Okay, next, tell the expedition to be a making a joke. That one is pretty simple. If Sometimes an easy way to get exposition out the way is just to put it in a job. Take your character who's the funniest one, who tends to be comedic relief, and let them say the information in the funniest way they can, because if we're laughing, we are willing to accept exposition. Finally, put a bomb on the disabled, which is the Hitchcock thing. If you know something bad or scary is about to happen to the character while they talk about exposition, it leads to increased tension that takes a that takes the noticeability of exposition away. What that essentially is saying for all of you guys is if you specifically have exposition, it's a lot of exposition. If you do something like putting a bomb under the table, which I don't recommend doing just that because it's too obvious nowadays, is what is allowing the actual individuals who are watching it, they be like, oh my God, that's a bomb that's going to explode at some point. They don't know it's underneath them right now as I'm talking. So you're gonna lean in and you're gonna be listening to this, to listen to this expression even more intently because you're worried that at any moment these characters can die. So it's really simple if you wanna make it even uh, a smaller way is if you have exposition, if you can find a way to add tension to what's happening or add worry for what can happen to the characters in that moment, we're willing to listen to the exposition more and forget that it's information that just needs to be relayed, okay? So before I jump into short film tips, is there any thoughts, questions on plot? This is usually the, the, the most complicated place. So I just wanna make sure folks are understanding this. Nobody? Okay. Well, real quick. There's one question that came in early and kind of relates to this. Okay. Basically taking experience, this person's a journalist, they say, and they, they think that they're a great writer, but they're wondering how to take that type of writing and shape it into a film script or plot. Mm -hmm. Okay, got you. So it's interesting. Like it's all, I think, you know, one of the good things is usually if you're doing or working within journalism, we already understand a good amount of how things happen with writing, which is good. Now, knowing journalism and working within it doesn't always mean that the journalists, uh, the understandings that you're building out work within it. Because I've seen many journalists who like, you know, specifically, they're just writing very run of the mill, like this is the news. And there's a, some journalists who specifically are able to build out these stories that you can honestly interact in, uh, enjoy as if we're reading like a short film. I think there's one guy on Twitter, I have to look him up, who's really, really great at it. Um, but essentially what you can be taking from your journalistic understandings is one thing I know all journalists can do very, very well is able to sit down and do a bunch of research to put their stuff together. So I highly recommend focusing in on that. Figuring out who characters are, use your journalistic understanding to like dig up, learn more about them, learn about who they are, how they tick, and bring that into your stories. So you have a really, really great place to start with in the understanding of how to write. But I think on a journalist level, what you might not know yet are some of like the basic understandings of what it means to actually build out a story. So jump into those and it's just leaves what I'm talking about right now and then adding your journalistic understanding of being able to do research and learning more about people and bringing that out. But also the other good thing on the journalist side is that more often than not, really interesting stories can be stories that are also true or are happening. And because you have your, your, your hand on the pulse of what's happening, whether it's around you or overall, and you know what's happening in America, anywhere that you're going from, you can pull from those stories to bring them into your work or base stories on them as well. So there's a wealth of different things that you can do with a, journal, uh, a journalistic background and understanding. It's just a case that if you have that background, start focusing more on understanding characters, understanding plot, and how to build those out because the actual interesting layers and people that you're gonna be dealing with is probably stuff you're gonna be able to pull into your uh, stories no matter what. So, you know, hopefully that uh, answers that question specifically. No, that was great, thank you. Okay, great, great. Uh, anything else before we jump ahead or any other questions? No, I think we're good to move on. Okay, sweet. So next thing is just short film tips overall. So here's a big thing to really keep in mind. 
The shorter, the better. Um, a good short film does not have to be 15 to 20 minutes long. A strong short film that tells a good story in three minutes is more valuable than a mediocre short film that lasts 10 minutes. I cannot tell you guys how true this is and it's something that I will live and die upon. You do not need a 15 or 16 or 18 or 20 minute short film. You just don't in most, of the, in most instances. Now, can you show me places where I'm wrong? Sure, but for the most part, the shorter that your short film is, the better. It's a calling card. It's to show folks you can do this. You don't need 20 or, you know, you know, 20 or 22 minutes. At that point, if you get into 20 plus minute thing for a short film, you will be better off just actually writing a pilot and shooting that instead of the short. Um, also, here's the thing to keep in mind. I just be completely honest with you about most execs and people who are going to watch your stuff. They don't want to have to watch um, something that's super, super long. They're usually not. So if you can put a short film that's five minutes really strong in front of an executive, he or she will be far more willing to check that out in comparison to something that's 50 or 20 minutes that's going to take up that type of time. Especially, it's even worse if those 50 to 20 minutes and your short also is exponentially mediocre or bad. So I highly recommend as you're building out shorts, try to keep them short, concise. At most, uh, let's see, I would recommend maybe at most 12 minutes, uh, maybe 15 at the very, very most, but I would highly recommend keep your shorts anywhere between maybe like four to 10 at most and you'll be okay. But seriously, the shorter and more concise you can tell a story, the better, especially when it comes to folks listening, folks watching, and then also even with um, festivals. Um, something I've learned very much with festivals is they would much rather be able to, you know, if they have a 20 minute slot and they can put in five really strong shorts, that's five minutes versus a 20 minute short that's mediocre, they're gonna go with the shorter ones. And also, it also makes it easier that let's say they have a bunch of uh, longer short films. And then finally, they want to be able to plug in like one five for a minute one. That's going to be in your favor than the other way around. So please, the shorter, the better. I mean that. Be practical. Uh, this is the same thing I brought up before. If you don't know special effects, if you don't know VFX, don't write that stuff just yet. Unless you have someone that you're willing to spend money on to come and do the work for it, write the stuff you know you can actually make at this point. Okay, find strong moments. Most people will remember your entire short film, but they will remember one scene more, uh, one scene that really, really sticks with them. Like uh, to give you an example, uh, the short film I did on time that was it uh, won HBO, um, you know, got me into Ryan Murphy's program. More often than not, people usually remember either two parts in it, either well three. They either remember the van at the top. They remember the woman getting arrested or they remember the young child uh, fighting in the back of the cop car. It's either one of those three things. They may not remember my entire film, but they remember the emotion of it and they remember one core single moment. Now, you want your film to be good in general, but I do admit that having a core single moment that really stands out makes a difference because usually that core single moment is gonna be what people remember your short film by. Next. Do not write your feature. Please don't. It's the biggest mistake you can do. If you have a feature idea, and it might be the most amazing feature in the world, but here's the thing. It's not a short film. Do not take your feature that is probably going to be anywhere from 90 to 120 pages and try to just cut out pieces of it to put into your short. The reason why I recommend not doing that is because what you're going to do is you're going to try and tell this huge story in five or six pages. You're not going to be able to do that. So everything is going to feel truncated. It's not going to feel earned. It's going to feel confusing because you're not trying to tell a small, simple story that can actually be told in the amount of time that you're doing it versus trying to tell your huge future, uh, your huge feature um, in a short amount of time. So please stay away from that. If you're going to write a feature, figure out how you can take a piece of that feature that feels like a super contained idea and build that out or come up with something else that's similar to it in theme, but can still work in a short amount of time. Don't make a, a short that has to be to be continued or folks need to ask a hundred questions to understand what's happening. If you usually, if you try to write your 
feature in your short. It's going to fail. It's not going to be strong. Stay away from that. Next, be personal. Uh, it's never a bad idea to write a story that's near and dear to your heart. OK, you don't, have to, you don't always have to do this. And maybe you want to do sci-fi stuff or do horror stuff. Then figure out an idea or something that means a lot to you and see how you can build it out. But the more personal you can make it, usually ends up, it ends up making it stronger for the most part. Finally, um, make every word of dialogue count. Is the same thing being said twice. Can lines be replaced with an action that conveys the same meaning? It's a dialogue that's what, uh, something we can see. Is verbal conflict moving the story forward or revealing information about the character? If not, why is it there? Is the exposition natural or clumsy? Is the dialogue true to this type of character? Like you only have so much time in five to 10 pages. So you really, really want your dialogue, every single piece of dialogue to make a difference and be impactful and powerful, which is why you wanna stay away from the exposition because the more you have in a short film, the less I'm gonna care about your dialogue because I know that it isn't really pushing the story. Not really. In comparison to this, where if you're doing everything visually, then your dialogue should always be there to push the visuals forward. It should not be the other way around. So be very judicious. And if anything, the best short films sometimes I see tend to not have that much dialogue in the first place. So keep that in mind as well. All right, so finally, we're gonna to come to short film cliches and other cliches to avoid. So this is pretty big, and I really want you guys to keep this in mind. Uh, this, I'm not saying that you can't do any of these. I'm not saying that, but I am telling you, these are the type of cliches we see constantly in short films, in student films. And I, I, even I have done some of them, I'm not gonna lie to you. So I'm not telling you that you can't do it, but I just wanna make it clear to you, the more you use them, the less unique your film is going to be. So just to give you an understanding, smoking cigarettes look cool. It's done all the time. Guns constantly in film. Black and white for no reason. Don't make your film black and white unless there's a reasoning for why you're doing it. That doesn't make it more artsy. It makes you look amateurs. Uh, stories about prostitutes. It's done so much. You don't need to do that. Stories about ballerines or dancers. It's been done so many times. Stories featuring clowns. Done so many times. Can you think of something that we haven't seen on a regular basis? Alarm clock openings. It's kind of like the regular thing you constantly see when folks are trying to, you know, waking up for the morning. Stay away from that. Um, gratuitous running sequences. Um, essentially, that means like, you know, like the Tom Cruise thing where he's just constantly running wherever he's going. You don't need that in your short film. Try and stay away from it. Uh, blown out Tarantino trunk shots. Uh, just in general, I recommend staying away from trying to emulate Tarantino. He is his own filmmaker. You are your own filmmaker. You can appreciate what he's doing, but too many people try to already copy him on a regular basis. Figure out how you would do this idea instead of trying to back up on what he's doing. Um, next one. Here's another one. Suicide. Seen all the time. There's a good chance that your character dying isn't going to be as moving as you think. And especially if you're really learning this for the first time, try to think of something that folks aren't used to because we see suicide a lot when it comes to shorts. Um, let's see, let's pick another one out of here. Uh, films about filmmaking, just don't do that. We, it's very, very, uh, it's just Hollywood does it all the time, making films about themselves. So try to come up with something that is unique unto yourself that we haven't seen before. Uh, flashbacks, try to keep them out of your short films because you only have a certain amount of time. Let's see, water wall music in your short. That's a huge no-no for me. Music should be something that actually enhances what you are putting together. Music should not be hiding the fact that your script or story is weak or it's not pushing itself forward. What I've noticed is when I see water wall music or too much music in a short, usually it tells me that the director or the writer wasn't able to convey the emotions that they wanted. So now they're using music to try and get you to feel that emotion and force it on you instead of the character's actual understandings, motivations, and what they do being the reason why you care about them. So stay away from music. If you need music to make your uh, scene stronger or make it actually work, then there's something intrinsically wrong with your scene in the first place. Another one, nudity for no reason. Just, you know, at this point, 
do you want to put media in your stuff? That's totally fine. But if it's just having some guy or some girl naked just because it's naked and it can be in your film, that's not smart. That's not an intellectual. That's not fun. That's not interesting. That's just very amateurish and it's going to be noticeable. Leave it be. Um, cutting hair to show trauma. It's done a lot with women characters. And I would just say, I'm not going to say don't do that, but just be aware that a woman character going to cut off their hair to say I'm stronger than what's happened to me is something we just see on a regular basis. Okay, um, geniuses that know everything. Don't write house in your short films. It's way too obvious. And uh, that's how the character only works when you really understand how to build them out. And you're not gonna have that type of time in your shorts, okay? Uh, let's see, gangsters. The majority of us are not gangsters. We haven't been around them. We don't know them. You probably don't know them. Just point blank. Like maybe you do, but again, you probably not a gangster yourself. I just highly recommend, you know, sticking away from that, especially if it's not uh, what you know or truly understand, because more than likely, you're just going to be writing about them from the lens of how you view things in TV and film. And if you have to write your understandings from another show or another film, that's inherently already a problem because it means that you don't have a lived experience or done research on these people or this thing. Another one we can jump into is uh, long car conversations. Just, you know, you don't have a lot of time in your actual shorts. You know, stay away from scenes where you need both your characters to be constantly talking unless there is something huge that they're saying that folks aren't expecting. Uh, next, cursing the curse. You know, I don't I don't mind anybody cussing in the film. I do not mind that. It can be enjoyable. It often is really enjoyable and hilarious. But if you're just cussing for the sake of making your character sound edgier or stronger, it's not going to work. And honestly, it's going to look cheesy. And then the last thing I'll say is like, uh, two, bad sound. Uh, people will forgive if your film doesn't look great. But people will never forgive your film for having bad sound where folks can't hear. If you do that, no one will watch it. And then the car won't start. And that's just a big thing in horror in general. Like, if the car has been working really, really well all the way up until this time, and then you run out when the bad guy's coming after you, jump in your car, and now out of all the times, this is the car when it finally doesn't turn the minute that you put on your keys, it's just going to feel very, very cliche and coincidental. Now, there's a whole bunch of other short film cliches in here that you can look at and even ask me about, but these are ones that I really want you to keep in mind. It's not to say that you should avoid all of them, but I am telling you, if you look up and your film has one, two, three, four, five, or six, or even more of these in it, there's a good chance that you're not creating something that is inherently unique and new unto yourself. All right. And then finally, when it comes to the last one, you should actually have fun with this. Um, writing your final project, a final script shouldn't feel like a chore. Writing isn't easy, but it shouldn't feel impossible. Writing is a skill you have to practice to become better. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Go outside your boxes with your stories. Write your story for yourself and not what others will think of it. And don't be afraid to fail. And the biggest thing I want to keep in mind before I finish up and open it up to more questions is writing isn't easy, but it shouldn't feel impossible. Writing is a skill you have to practice to become better. I mean this with an absolute... Um, Vengeance. A lot of people think that writing intrinsically is just something that talented people do. You're just born, you come out the womb, you know how to write. There are people in this world who are intrinsically just good writers out the womb, not going to lie. But even those people have to actually learn to write. They do. Every single person who writes had to learn how to write in some type of capacity. And here's the thing about it. Writing is quite literally an actual skill. You have to be constantly doing it to get better at it. So even if your story isn't great or isn't amazing the first time, the second, the third, or fourth time, if you keep on working at it, you will slowly get better. But that only comes with time, practice, and also going through those periods where your work isn't that great. But if you stick with it, it will slowly get stronger. So that's essentially everything when it comes to understanding what to do and what not to do in your short films. And I hope all of this makes sense. And let's open up the floor to anyone who wants to open up, ask questions about this. 
and like get a even deeper understanding or focus on anything or go back to anything that I talked about before in this. Awesome. Thanks, Xavier. We've got a couple questions that came in. Um, I'll call this first one out fairly generally speaking, but what would you say is the sort of most challenging part of the entire filmmaking process, not just even script writing, but what, what would you say is like the biggest challenge or the biggest obstacle that you always face when you go into a project? Oh man, uh, honestly, if I would say myself, it's the actual, it's the writing, it's the writing. Like there's a lot of people out there who, you know, they can direct well. And there's a lot of people out there who can, you know, come up with a hundred different, really great, really awesome, really well to do ideas, ideas. And I mean that specifically, but the actual process of sitting your butt down and going from the, the idea to writing it, literally putting pen to paper or, you know, type, you know, uh, put in, you know, keyboard to screenwriter program. I don't know, it's not a great uh, example, but that to me is the hardest, like sitting down and just coming up with this new idea and then uh, building it out. So just to give you an example, the last script I wrote was a Southern Gothic um, that deals with black people and reincarnation in the deep South. And before I ever actually wrote a script, I sat down and I wrote this treatment that was about 20 pages. And one of the parts of it was the history. And I sat down and from the early 1800s to 2000, you know, uh, 2020, I mapped out the history of this family and who they were and what they had done to get to this day. I didn't do that because it's fun. That is grueling in any type of way, but I needed to do that so I could actually understand intrinsically how everyone would act. So honestly, I think for me personally, the, the, the moment of taking an idea and actually building it into something tangible that people can then look at and read, that's really the hardest part. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of people in the industry who um, they know how to come up with a good idea. They can say, well, do this, 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 this but don't necessarily understand what it means to sit down and actually get into the nitty gritty of creating. So, you know, hopefully that helps to answer it. That's for me is always the hardest part of starting from scratch and building up. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. Appreciate that. Uh, another question that we had come in um, and this kind of relates to, I mean, you remember when you were in undergrad this person's asking, you know, how does the industry work when it comes to independent filmmakers getting their content out there? They specifically mentioned like on services such as Netflix or Hulu, if someone wanted to pitch a film or a TV series to a streaming service, how could they go about doing that? So um, <laughs> big question, uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah, what's your perspective on that? So here's the thing to be honest with you about, uh, is, if you want to be able to pitch something to Netflix or Hulu, there's so many different ways you can go, but none of the ways are in any way guaranteed. Like the, the most, the regular way is that, you know, you've done enough work in the industry to where you now have a manager or, and or an agent and you can ask them, hey, it's just someone oh, somewhere over at Netflix or Hulu that I can sit down with. Or maybe you've done a short film, someone who's an executive at Netflix notices it and brings you in. I've had both of these two things happen um, to me, for example. Um, another way is you do something that goes really viral and everybody loves it. So someone actually reaches out to you about it. Um, there's a mountain of different ways to get to that point, but you have to keep in mind that it's not something that you truly control to a degree, if you can make something go viral where they pay attention, you never know. Um, but really the quickest, easiest way is to work enough to where um, you get noticed by a manager or agent and then you say, hey, let's uh, work with them. But, it, but then you need to keep this in mind too. Uh, while Netflix and Hulu, for example, are production companies, they also work with other individuals. So you might have an idea, maybe you go work with a producer, that producer ends up working with a bigger production company, that production company takes your idea to Netflix or Hulu and it gets you know done to that way. There's a thousand different ways. And honestly, what I wouldn't recommend you do is try to focus on, oh, how can I get it to Netflix? Or how can I get it to Hulu? That's really too big of a, of a, of a push right now, especially at your level, possibly. But here's the other thing too. I, there's been chances where I've won 
literally won contests that put me, you know, to speak to a Netflix exec or a Hulu exec or things like that. And you actually kind of find out pretty quickly that even as you meet these execs, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have the power to get your thing greenlit anyway. There's a lot of execs in the industry who are kind of working or making things via fear in the sense that they're like, okay, if I make something, and it's bad that I lose my job, which makes them very risk averse a lot of times. So you're really, it's really an uphill battle, to be honest with you. And what I wouldn't recommend is if that's the goal that you're thinking about, I would, I wouldn't say let go of it, but I wouldn't worry about that. And I would just focus on making as much work as possible. And the day that you get big enough or well known enough to be able to get into a room in Netflix or Hulu, it'll happen versus you trying to focus in on that. So I know that that's completely answer your question, but I hope it helps you to understand that it's not something you should worry about too much at this point. Just keep making your stuff. Yeah, no, that's great. And and kind of, you know, for the audience of CMFers, you know, they're coming, most of them are undergrad and mm -hmm. they're in this new world gonna be graduating at the end of the year. You know, you went the route of grad school would you talk a little bit about what that experience was like and, and if, if that's something that you would recommend, et cetera? Oh man, so that's a great question. Uh, it's really completely based on yourself. When I got out of uh, Alabama, I've been doing a lot of work at Camping Campus Movie Fest. I had had uh, a documentary there that won. Um, my little shorts that I'd done there had done well before. But even then, I realized this is what I love, this is what I enjoy, but I didn't feel like I had gotten enough uh, understanding through the school because at Alabama, it was a telecommunications department. And the telecommunications department is completely different than actually having a tried and true film department. So because of that, I said, I need more time to figure out why I wanna do this, how to do this and how to get better, which that made me decide to apply to USC, UCLA, AFI, NYU and Columbia. And then I finally made the decision to go to USC. So here's the thing that you have to keep in mind. If you've already gone to a film school, then you don't need to go to another film school. you know. And if you also feel like your writing is strong enough then you don't have to worry about that. Like I'll say this point, like anyone who's in this right now, if you are a ridiculously strong writer, you've already written a couple of scripts and you have a short under your belt that's actually strong. And that's something you can literally ask folks so you can get an understanding. Then you probably don't need, you don't need a uh, film school unless you really want to. You could probably just come out here and start working and see if you can actually make the connections. But if you are just learning that you really enjoy this and you love this, but you feel like you haven't had enough time to really uh, fully understand and learn more, then you might want to think about uh, film school. Now, is it going to be a lot of money? Yes. You just got to get over that. Ain't nothing you can do about it. You're going to go into debt, point blank. That's just what it is when it comes to most film schools, unless you already have money under your pocket or your mom and dad are already rich. Then if you are, don't even go to film school. Ask them for the money and go make it. Go make your feature. Like seriously, it, it's really. You'd be surprised. Like literally having. I don't. I'll never. It's weird to say this, but sometimes even having a not that great feature is better than having a phenomenal short because they know now that you can make a feature. So you've already gotten over what 1%, what nine, the 99% of filmmakers haven't done in this industry. Like, you know, one of the reasons why I did my documentary is because I love horror, I love black folks, I wanna talk about that stuff. But I also wanna be able to say that I have done a feature film. Also another reason why I did the digital series, um, Johnny, is because I wanted to be able to show them that I can do 30 minutes in hour length type work. And that's the piece that I got Emmy nominated for. Uh, so yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, did that answer the question? I'm trying to make sure. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you gave some, some really interesting perspective there for sure. I, I think, you know, in, in your introduction, there are all of these programs that you had participated in and gotten, uh, you know, credit for or nominated or win awards, et cetera. Like, how do you, was that stuff that happened while you were in school? Was that stuff you found on your own? How did you come across all those opportunities? Got you. So uh, one of the things that, one thing is that like, you know, Campus Movie Fest tends to, you know, uh, 
hit folks up when there's different open things like that. So that's another one place where I was noticing things. But also, I admit that I also scour the internet on a regular basis to find different uh, things to enter and apply to. And I recommend anyone else doing that uh, to, to help yourself out. But here's something to keep in mind too, and also goes back to the film school thing I was bringing up. There are a few select labs and stuff like that, that if you get into those, and you get pretty far in them, you don't need film school uh, for real. So for example, like a few of those is like, you know, the Tribeca uh, fellowships, um, anything that deals with Berlantau, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, you get into anything with uh, the Sundance Labs, anything on the Sundance Labs is really, really great. And that'll help you. Uh, anything that's with film independent as well can make a can make a huge difference like there's a couple of fellowships that you can look out there that make a difference like i think another one the uh, academy nichols is probably the most well known and most prominent uh feature script writing competition there is out there like there's no one bigger than that because it's done by the academy you get through that that can make a difference now here's the thing you have to keep in mind you can do all of those ones and still have nothing happen so you need to be ready for that. That's one of the things that comes with the industry. You can do a lot of great things and it still takes forever. Uh, I started with Campus Movie Fest all the way back with 2010, uh, 20, something like that. It's been, it's been a decade and I've made features. I've gotten Emmy nominated. I've done all this stuff. And technically I'm still in the beginnings of my career when it comes to the wider uh, you know, industry. So you have to think about that too, because you can have individuals like, I don't know who can who can bust out of nowhere and just you know they get big and understanding with that is that more than likely when you see that that means that whoever that person has just overnight success there's been like 10 years of them working even before that so the idea of just like being able to make your thing pop out and you're just this new big sensation is not as prominent or what usually happens in the first place and usually if that happens i can almost always promise you that individual has connections and or family that already has a lot of money to let them do that for the average person who's trying to come into this industry and doesn't already have connections to money you are going to have to fight to get your stuff because you are going to have to convince other people that your work is worth being made in comparison to someone who has the money, it says my stuff is worth being made because I have the money. So you just need to be uh, to 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 be ready for that. And yeah, um, a lot of the ones that I brought up, Sundance, Film Independent, Tribeca, check a lot of the well known. Uh, a lot of the well-known film festivals tend to have fellowships with them. So if you have a film festival, you it's prominent, you care about it, look it up and see if there's fellowships beside it and start applying to those. Because if you can get into like, again, if you can get into a Sundance Lab, so that's the most, probably the most preeminent, most well-known one. If you can get into that, the specific the screenwriter or episodic, uh, you might not need film school, but it can still make a difference and help you if you want that. Because even then get into those, doesn't guarantee that your film is going to get made. So, yeah. Yeah, no, really appreciate that. I know we're, we're coming up to the end of our time. Um, something that a lot of people, I think, are just asking each other these days because, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people watching stuff right now. Mm -hmm. what, what, are, what are you watching? What would you recommend that's out there for our participants to take a look at? So a uh, couple of things, Infinity Train amazing you should watch it i think it's on hbo max uh amphibia that's on disney plus really really amazing gem of a cartoon that's kind of like equal like adventure time or Stephen universe if you have a chance you should pick that you should check that out it's no longer on uh being made anymore but gravity falls absolutely amazing um you should watch raised by wolves that's on hbo max by really scott really good really strong grounded sci-fi love it to death uh netflix try love death and robots really, really great uh, piece that does really, really great stuff in sci-fi and animated understanding. On an anime, on an anime side, you'd be watching things like Black Clover, My Hero Academia, that's great. Also, you can watch The Queen's Gambit, really, really good on Netflix. Also, I highly recommend, it's a show called The 3%, that's a Brazilian, you know, it's a Brazilian show, so it's, you know, completely in Spanish, but I love it. It's really, really well due. And, you know, more folks need to be okay with watching things with subtitles. That's totally fine. Do that. Watch it. Of course, if you haven't seen it before, go look at Hereditary by Ari Esther. Amazing. Midsummer, Amazing. Bong Joon-ho uh, with Parasite. You need to be watching that. Just, you know, there's so much great stuff, you know, out there right now. And it can feel overwhelming. Um, but just right now, we're at a point where there's so much great stuff being done. 
and it's being done in almost all genres. So there's almost always something out there, whether it's older being made right now, that you can watch that can speak to what you're trying to do. So I just, you know, highly recommend that. So those are a couple of ones. Also recommend Lovecraft Country. Really, really good. Really, really strong. Um, Waves, another film that I thought was great. An older school one that I think everybody should watch is Moonlight. Really, really well done film. Love that one to death. And then uh, one of the, and then of course, you know, for me personally, one of my snacks that I love to watch, and I don't care what anybody says about it, I love the entire Final Destination um, series. It is one of my favorite series, and I will die on the hill of saying it's amazing. So those are a couple of things that, you know, I watched and check out. We appreciate that, Xavier, and thank you so much for the time tonight. Um, uh, any final words for our students at home uh, as they embark on the end of their or middle of their college careers? <laughs> yeah, I would say if you ever have any questions and stuff, always feel free to reach out to me. It's pretty easy to find me on the internet and uh, talk. And, and usually I'm better if you just email me. So just do that. Uh, the other thing I would say is like, you know, it's a marathon. It's not a race. Uh, if you're expecting to get out of, get out of, you know, college, get some money, go make your, go make your short or go make your feature. Great. Do that. But just don't expect it to be a thing that makes you just blow up in the industry. It almost never works like that. And for the people that it does, they didn't do anything right. They were just lucky in that situation. And you need to be ready for how much of a slog it can be to be in this industry till you get quote unquote your shot. And you never know if that can happen. So I just, you know, I say this to say that I want you to understand what you're getting into and understand that you truly have to love this and appreciate it. Because if you're coming into this to try and be rich or be well off or you got a long way ahead of you unless you already have the type of folks around you that can give that to you intrinsically. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate the time, Xavier. Um, it's always a pleasure to see you, to work with you, and continued congratulations on your success. And uh, I know that we'll, we'll see each other soon. So um, thanks again. And uh, that concludes uh, our workshop for November. We'll see everyone in December. There's a bunch of cool opportunities happening with Campus Movie Fest through the end of the year. So. Uh, check it out at campusmoviefest.com and then do make sure to tune in for our November movie we're making week premiere on December 1st, 8 p.m. Uh, campusmoviefest.com. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Xavier. All right. Now, catch you later. Bye-bye.